It's a great pleasure to introduce Casper Jacobs from the University of Leiden, some time of Oxford. Casper. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone for being here. Um, so, you know, I'm sure uh, I'm not the only one here who um, read David Wallace's paper on um, fast realism. Uh, interesting uh, and in some ways really controversial, um, I would say. So this is just my attempt to see what's going on there and maybe some modes like many of you have also been going through those things. I'm also very curious to hear at the end what everyone else thinks of this. But so it's going to be a quite a broad picture. Lots of science talk about models and representation and equivalence. Uh, so hopefully that's OK. Uh, and so in that spirit, I want to start with something um, that I would sort of call the origin myth of philosophy of physics. Um, and so it's a myth, so it's not meant to be based in any kind of historically accurate uh, you know, research. Um, probably not everyone agrees with it, you know, like any myth, probably most people think it's false. Um, but for me, at least, it's a helpful way of thinking. What's going on? Am I doing what I'm doing, philosophy of physics? So here's how the myth goes. Um, it says a long time ago, um, you know, think of the ancient Greeks, for example, the language of physics was some sort of natural language. Um, so Aristotle had some theories about physics. Um, he didn't do a lot of um, you know, differential uh, equations and so on. It's not yours. Um, so yeah, there was. You know, back, I so I'm glad to be here to uh, this special session of the first session of the year of the logic and religion. Uh, um, yeah, so you wrote things about um, physics, sure. Um, but, you know, anyone could, as it were, pick up his book and read through it um, and sort of understand it. I mean, of course, um, you know, physical theories might introduce different vocabulary, difficult concepts in natural language. Uh, but in order to understand those, you know, typically what you do is you'd say, well, Aristotle, you know, what does this word mean? And Aristotle would give you some more language to explain. We're all sort of within the confines of natural language, mostly, maybe some geometry. Um, you know, but then something changed. Um, the language of mathematics comes to pervade physical theory. So this is sort of where natural philosophy starts to separate into physics, which becomes mathematicized, and philosophy, um, which becomes a sort of separate discipline around the time of people like Newton, Leibniz, um, 17th, 18th century. Good. And so why is this important? This change from physics mostly within natural language to physics within um, a framework of mathematics, it's because you know, only the philosopher um, could interpret these mathematically expressed products of physics. It's something we don't have um, you know, a book, which is you know, just some sentences that we can more or less read. And if we don't understand some sentences, we can ask and say, what does this mean? And we'll get more sentences until hopefully we get something we do understand. Um, now we get you know, a book or a paper with lots of bits of mathematics, right? So maybe some rules for applying them and some what might call a partial interpretation. And um, well, we already know, you know there's a theory about um, fluid mechanics and these are the empirical results. Uh, but if we want to know, you know, what does it mean? Um, we'll have to interpret that bit of mathematics and we'll have to tell a story about when we've got these equations, when we've got these models, what do they say about the natural world? So that's the origin myth. Um, I haven't seen it expressed explicitly in a lot of places, but one place in which I have found something um, that expresses this is in a book by uh, Dean Rickles, introduction, it's a, an introduction to philosophy of physics. Um, and there's a chapter where he says what he thinks philosophy of physics is or should be. And so Rickles says, if the primary task of the physicist is to construct models and theories of the world, then the primary task of a philosopher of physics um, is to interpret these products of physics, you know, theories, models, simulations. Okay, so there's a clear division of labor. Philosophers are not themselves physicists. They're not trying to produce theories, models, simulations, taking them from physics, but they're adding something, something the physicists cannot or won't do, which is saying what those models really mean, what they say in the world, right? And so this is the question of interpretation and um, phrased in this way by Basson Frazen, under what conditions is the theory, what does the theory say? 
questions like, um, who is, you know, many philosophers of physics are interested in many different things, um, but at least personally, this is how I approach lots of what I do in philosophy of physics, where I think of it as taking a theory, uh, which is mostly mathematics with some rules about um, what it's meant to say about the world, uh, but then trying and dig down and say, what does all this really mean? So we could take electrodynamics and we could say, um, what does the theory say about the world? Does it say that there is um, an electromagnetic field um, that sort of makes particles move in a certain way? If so, what are the consequences? And so we could look at the Heron of Bohm effects and say, well, if that's the case, if this is a theory about the F field, and then it must act non locally. Different interpretation, which says no, there's actually the vector potential field, the A field, which acts on particles and makes them move. Um, and if that's the case, the theory might be local, but it wouldn't be H invariant. Those are the kinds of ways to answer this question of interpretation. And the way I take it, this is typically done, is using again the needs of natural language. Of course, we can also prove theorems and establish certain formal results, but in the end, in interpreting a theory, typically one would specify the ontology of the theory, say the fundamental relations, one would say which bit of mathematics don't correspond to anything in the world. So we're using all these, as it were, metaphysically thick and heavy notions of objects, properties, correspondence, fundamentality, grounding, and so on, to get a handle of on what the theory really means. Okay. So as I've said, the philosopher's preferred tool for doing this, for giving an interpretation is natural or formal language. Um, it, it seems that we can't just get by doing just mathematics if we want to answer this question of interpretation. But there are some downsides to this use of language. Um, the downsides that David was in his paper sort of focuses on um, and to put it very broadly, we could say that language seems to draw distinctions finer than we would like uh, when we look at the theory itself. Right? So um, for one, the same theory um, may involve, may be able to receive different linguistic interpretations. So this is essentially the problem of underdetermination. Right? And this comes in various guises. So you could have one single theory, um, you know, something like um, particle quantum mechanics, uh, and we could think, well, that one theory, the same mathematical formalism, has different interpretations. We want to know what that formalism says about what the world is like, if that theory were true. Um, there's just different answers, and they're all compatible with the same empirical evidence, and they're all compatible with the same formalism. We could also think of different formalisms, um, which in some sense are mathematically equivalent. So we might think of Newtonian mechanics set in a Maxwell space time, which is a space time that has um, a standard of absolute rotation, but no standard of absolute acceleration. And we could think of Newtonian mechanics, um, Newtonian gravitation sets within a Newton Cartan spacetime, um, which is a curved spacetime that has an absolute standard of acceleration. Um, and prima facie, it would seem that if we take those two frameworks and we ask, what would the world be like if any of them were true, we'd get very different answers. If we describe them with linguistic means, we'd say, in one theory, you know, part of the fundamental structure is uh, an affine connection, whereas in the other, it's the standard of rotation. It would seem that they're different, even though mathematically, one might argue um, they're the same, but they're equivalent. And then finally, of course, there's a case where we have two formalisms that are not even mathematically equivalent, um, and, and they could, of course, receive different interpretations. Uh, but, but those cases are not the ones that I'm going to discuss today. So that's one issue, a related issue is, of course, that changes that might seem continuous between all the new theories from a mathematical perspective. Um, their interpretations couched in linguistic terms might look radically different. So again, this is a classic um, sort of charge against scientific realism, which says all theories were very successful, but they have very different interpretations, right? They might have posited something like the ether. If you look at the ontology, um, it would have in very different stuff within the ontology. And the response to that is to say, well, right, but if you look at the level of mathematical structure, we actually see continuity. So that's good for scientific realism. But then, of course, the problem is if we still use language to give an interpretation of the theory to ask what the world would be like if the theory went true, uh, we've still got this discontinuity. And finally, uh, and a little bit more generally, it might just seem that language or describing a theory using natural or formal languages 
um, is going to introduce conceptual machinery that's not present in the formalism. So machinery that might seem redundant or superfluous, uh, physically meaningless. Right? And so you might think of something like a subject predicate distinction, uh, a notion of identity, transcendental individuation of something like space time points. One might argue that those things are not present within a mathematical formalism of the theory, uh, but they are present as soon as we use some sort of formal or natural language um, to explain what that theory says. Um, I, I think this is still a bit controversial, so if we just talk about something like transcendental individuation. I think Wallace uh, wants to say that this is something that we bring in when we bring in language, and that's not there within the formalism of um, a mathematically complicated theory. Uh, but one might, of course, think that if we've got you know something like general relativity and we've got our models that contain manifolds and the manifolds contain points, um, then we're all already looking at things that have identity and we're already looking at things that can be permuted to get different isomorphic models. You might think none of that really requires language. Um, but you know, for the sake of the argument, sort of consider this claim that introducing language also introduces extraneous entities concepts to the interpretation of physical theories. So given that language has these uh, disadvantages, um, the way I understand Wallace's proposal um, is a, of a mass first approach to interpretation is an approach to interpretation which aims to free philosophy from the yoke of language. Um, it's trying to say we can do what we want to do, which is answer the question of interpretation without having to introduce distinctions that are finer than we would like. We do this by staying closer to the mathematics, taking the mass first rather than looking at the language, rather than trying to explicate in the theory in a linguistic framework. But as Wallace admits, uh, many details remain to be filled in, uh, and the devil may be in those details. Um, and this, of course, I think is fully right. So um, you know, the rest of what I'm going to say is essentially just trying to fill in some of those details or look at different ways one might fill in the details. Um, raising some questions, I'll admit I'm quite skeptical of the maths first approach. Um, but you know, I don't want to argue that it's impossible. Rather, I want to argue that once we look at those details, right, we see a lot more complications um, than it may seem from paper. OK, so in more detail, these are the claims I want to make. There are two claims and there is a, a worry. So the first claim, which you know, is maybe a, a relatively minor claim, uh, is just to say that the mass first approach, um, Wallace sometimes describes this as just being the semantic approach. Um, you know, as soon as we adopt the semantic approach, we've already got mass first realism. That's the kind of phrase Wallace uses. So I don't think that's right. Um, so I'll spend part of the talk showing that when we look at the semantic approach, in particular, the notion of scientific representation on the semantic approach, we don't at all get something that would look like Wallace's mass first approach. And then, of course, right, it's interesting to look at different things we could do, things that go beyond the semantic view. Um, is there any kind of scientific representation that is compatible with the mass first approach? And so I'll survey two different accounts. Uh, but what we'll find is that on both accounts, it's going to be extremely difficult for um, philosophers of physics to actually say what the world is like according to a theory on the mass first approach. And so we accept the origin myth I've presented, and we accept that um, you know, the result for philosophy of physics is to answer the question of interpretation than this. Uh, is a negative result, right? It means that we're limited in what we can say about physical theories. And this leads to a worry, and the worry is that on the mass first approach, right, if we do accept the mass first approach and we will take one of those routes that establish a mass first kind of representation, um, philosophy of physics as a discipline will become radically different. But those philosophers of physics who've taken themselves to um, do, you know, do what the origin myth describes and take the products of physicists, right, to say what they mean using mostly linguistic means. Um, those philosophers um, are in for a surprise. They might need to change their ways. Again, you know, not necessarily a negative thing. You might think good. Not, you know, the kinds of philosophers of physics who have been doing this thing of trying to describe what theories say in terms of language have just been misguided all along. Um, but I think it's it's a consequence that's not you know um, clearly noted in, in Wallace's paper and maybe slightly an intended conference, so it seems good to highlight it. So here's the plan for the talk. 
Um, I'll start a bit just by clarifying uh, different concepts, and in particular, right, I've mentioned the semantic view, or this distinction between the syntactic and the semantic view. I'll make a bit more clear how I understand that distinction and how I understand uh, David Wallace's distinction between a language first and a math first approach. So that's part one. Then in part two, I'll address um, this minor claim, which is the kinds of representation on the semantic view. So I'll survey what represent, how representation on the semantic view is supposed to work, and we'll find that um, it doesn't really match on to um, how the math first view is characterized. Then in the third part, I'll look at alternative approaches to representation. Uh, so this is going to be slightly more speculative, uh, slightly more general, uh, but I think there are a few approaches we should consider, uh, and I'll highlight some objections to those approaches and some consequences they have for the think of interpretation. Uh, and that's going to be the final part of the talk, uh, which is basically trying to say, you know, where where will we end up if we really embrace a form of math? So, the syntactic and the semantic view. This is probably how um, you know many of you have encountered it. On the syntactic view, a theory is either identified or, in a slightly weaker version, presented as a set of sentences, either in natural language or preferably. Uh, you know, in first order logic, whereas on the semantic view, a theory is presented as a class of models, and maybe a stronger view identified with a class of models. Okay. I'm sure everyone's seen something like this. However, um, you know, some recent results have shown that this difference might be more illusory than we. So, of course, any set of sentences uh, will class define a class of models, right? The models that interpret those sentences in the logician sense and make them true, uh, and vice versa, any class of models, uh, you know, we can write down some sentences, maybe not in first order logic, uh, but in some generalization thereof, uh, some sentences which have those models as, uh, which have those sentences, some class of models which interpret those sentences. Right, so already it seems that maybe there isn't that stark of a difference, you might still think, isn't there some advantage, for example, to presenting a theory as a class of models rather than a class of sentences? So, for example, uh, you know, if you're an empiricist, you might think trying to distinguish the difference between observable and unobservable is really hard. On the syntactic view, we'd have to make the sort of hard cuts in the vocabulary we have, observable and unobservable vocabulary. It's kind of doomed because observation is theory laden and so on. Uh, whereas if we've got our models, right, we can look at the empirical substructures, uh, and this perhaps is more clean cut, it's more flexible, um, and we won't get into all those issues of the, the syntactic approach right, to this, and um, the view I take from France in 1980 to advance. Um, but some of this more recent literature has shown that many of those um, key notions of the semantic view, like empirical substructures, or like the structural content of the theory, are also definable syntactically. Right? So if I've got an idea of what the empirical substructures of my models are, then there will also be some way syntactically to distinguish between the empirical parts of the model and the, um, and the non-empirical parts of the model. So I think the standard way of putting the difference between the syntactic and semantic view might not be tenable. Um, it's also perhaps not the most useful in this debate. I don't think this is really where the important difference lies. So if I may be slightly revisionist, um, this is how I would but the important difference, which is that indeed on the syntactic view, a theory is presented as a set of sentences. And those are sentences that directly describe the physical world. Right? So we've, we've got sentences like um, electrons have negative charge. And so it's true that you know, given a set of sentences like that, we can look at the models that interpret those sentences, at least the intended models of the theory what will they be like? What, for example, will be the extension of the predicate is an electron? Well, it would be the set of all electrons, right? What's it going to be the extension of the predicate has negative charge? What will be the set of all things that have negative charge? So we've got sentences and we've got models, um, but there's a very particular relation between those sentences and things in the world, between those models and things in the world, um, right? Which is that the sentences are meant to directly describe the things in the world and the way they are. Whereas on the semantic view, um, the relation is rather that the models of the theory represent the world. So if we take the sentences of the theory, they're just going to be sentences of mathematics and the models themselves 
um, you know, their domain doesn't need to contain any physical objects. It can just be abstract mathematical models. But then we have this additional step where we take the models and somehow we set up a relation between the models and mapping between the models and the world. Right? And of course, you know, the, the, the details of this mapping, that's what the, the hard bit. Uh, but, you know, there's a very different way of representing the world from the syntactic view, um, where basically what we're doing is we're doing something very similar to what we're doing. Uh, you know, when I'm just talking to you, I'm uttering sentences and those sentences make some claim about the world. And what I'm not doing is defining a class of models where then we have to set up some sort of mapping between those models and the world. Right? And I think Wallace is actually on board with this reconception of the difference. So Wallace right? the theory world relation here, so on the semantic view, um, is representation and is more akin to the relation between map and territory than that between word and object. Right? So the latter is the way uh, the relation that's relevant to the syntactic view, where right? we've got a word and we've got an object and the word represents the object. Whereas in the semantic view, we've got those models, the maps, then we've got the territory, the world, and the map somehow represents. Casper, can I ask, in this, uh, there are two ideas on this slide, it seems to me. One is syntactic view tied to describe and thus the idea of compositional semantics, subsentential parts contribute to a total description by the sentence. But when you came to the semantic view, you said that the domain of a model is a set of abstract mathematical items. So that there's a definite two-stage procedure between language and concrete reality through the uh, Which of those is important to you? The, the, the denial of the sentence, sentenceness, sentence-like quality of reference semantics, or, or the denial, well, the indispensability of an abstract intermediary? Yeah, it's the latter. The latter, so that, that, is the so, okay, because that's not quite in his quote, right? Right. I mean, it just says map territory. It doesn't say map then pure mathematical object and thus territory. No, I take the map to be in the this case of the maps. Right. I mean, you know, of course. Well, yeah. So yeah, the map is analogous to the model. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. And so once we've got this distinction on the table, then if we adopt the semantic view, we can ask. How does a mathematical model, how does it come to represent the world? And in particular, does this representing require a linguistic intermediary? If we think about the map, I might ask, how does this map come to represent the streets of Oxford? And in particular, do we need some sort of linguistic intermediary to make that the case? So I think, for example, von Frasen's view on this is that, yes, we do need some sort of language. We need a self-locating assertion, right? The sort of dot that says you are here now, right? That's the sentence that we need in order for the map to be able to represent um, the streets of Oxford. So, sorry, just a quick question. By mathematical model, do you mean a set theoretic model? <coughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so we, you know, we can talk about Bourbaki style models that we've got yeah. sets with the domain in relations properties. Because of course, maths first is not confined to set theory. Right. Yeah. Right, good. Um, I mean, I, I don't take anything to hang on this, so I don't think it only applies to C theory. Um, and so what I take the language first, math first distinction to be, so I acknowledge this is not how uh, Wallace presents it, you know, Wallace sort of moves more closely to the standard distinction between the syntactic and the semantic view, which is on the difference between the ways theories are presented. Uh, but I, I find this distinction more fruitful Think about it. so apologies to, to David if this is not what was intended. Um, language first subscript Casper, that's my subscript Casper. Uh, I think the difference there is on the language first approach, the idea is we do need a linguistic intermediary, right? In order for those models to gain traction on the world, we need to do something, describe what they say, the proverbial you are here now dots, it right, needs to be provided. On the mass first approach, the answer would be no. Somehow we can make do just with the mathematics or with very minimal supplements to the mathematics. Okay, and I'll, I'll explain later how this might work. Um, but that's the very broad distinction, right? And of course, if we don't have to introduce the linguist uh, language, then also we don't have these disadvantages that I mentioned before. Just one minor comment. Uh, this linguistic intermediary doesn't need to be a translation of so the language first view on my account doesn't say that 
we should, as it were, provide a rational construction of a theory in an actual formal language. Um, it could be weaker than that. Um, so it could, for example, be something like what uh, Wallace calls a predicate precisification, which I take to be not quite a translation of the theory, uh, but something like a description of the theory uh, in language. It's right? so something that specifies the ontology of the theory, the ideology of the theory, um, the dynamics of the theory in a non-mathematical way, right? but short from actually providing a translation, a full first order logic framework or something like that. And then the math first realist simply adds to the math first approach um, that successful theories actually represent the problem. So we've got this notion of representation without needing language. What makes it realist is just to say those representations are accurate. They actually describe or approximately accurately describe the way the world is. This is Wallace's statement of math first scientific realism. Successful scientific theories succeed at least approximately in representing the systems which they're used to model, including features of those systems that are unobservable, right? The latter part makes it of realism rather than empiricism. I should say Wallace here only talks about representing. Um, I, I think that's slightly unfortunate. We want to talk about accurate representing, right? Because it holds the model can represent the world and even the unobservable parts, but it can represent them in a false way. Um, accurately represent. Okay, and so the purported advantages as far as realism are essentially that they avoid the disadvantages of language that I've mentioned. So um, the discontinuities that we have, the ontological discontinuities, which drive standard examples, this is what is quote, standard examples of underdetermination and discontinuity of theory change are invisible at the level of mathematical description of theories. Right, so the broad idea here is, suppose, for example, I've got two mathematically equivalent theories or formulations of the same theory. If we interpret them on a language first approach, we offer some sort of linguistic commentary of what those theories say about the world, then we're going to introduce differences. We might say that Newton Cartan theory is a flat space time, Maxwell Ma Maxwellian space time, uh, sorry, Newton Cartan theory is a curved space time, Maxwell's space time has a curved, uh, it's a flat space time. Flat curve seems a big difference on the level of mathematics. Wallace would say that difference disappears. Okay. Um, same thing with theory change. If we look at different theories, then over time the structure is approximately observed. I think that there are definitely some question marks here. Um, so uh, Wallace seems to assume quite a strong form of mathematical equivalence, which the math first approach is supposed to track. So if we think of that example uh, of the difference between Maxwell spacetime and Newton Cartan spacetime, of course there are you know mathematical mathematically relevant differences between those theories, right? The difference between a flat spacetime and a curved spacetime is one that we can define mathematically. It's not necessarily something that we just introduce using language. Right? So, so I have some initial skepticism about whether the math first approach could really avoid uh, discontinuities in this way, and I'll come back to that. Um, and another background assumption that's important to mention here is that Wallace um, assumes that cases of underdetermination, the, the real important case of underdetermination, are always cases in which we're dealing with two either mathematically equivalent theories or theories in which one theory is equivalent but adds redundant structure. So they're not mathematically equivalent, uh, but that's because one of the theories has redundant structure. Right? And so. Um, it's not clear to me whether that's always the case. If that's not the case, then even mass first realism uh, wouldn't be able to overcome those cases of underdetermination. So we're only looking at a limited class of cases of underdetermination. So that's one advantage. And then the other supposed advantage is that it's going to get rid of all this metaphysics, right? All these distinctions that we get in language that supposedly are not present in a mathematical framework. And so these are some of the quotes of the things Wallace doesn't seem to like. Um, considerations of ontology and ideology, um, ordinary talk of objects, properties and relations, overly fine metaphysical distinctions, and surprisingly metaphysical conversations. Um, right, so the mass first approach is supposed to deliver us from all those evils. Uh, we don't need to get into any kind of conversations about you know, whether it's possible to have relations with that relata, about whether space-time points are transcendentally individuated, whether you know anti-exeitism or something along those lines is true, those sort of 
conversations that one might often find in, in philosophy of physics and interpretations of theories. On the mass first approach, um, those questions are supposed to become superfluous. We could just look at the mathematics, uh, and the mathematics doesn't track these sort of distinctions and concepts. So now that we've you know, got our aim, uh, mass first realism, the question becomes can mass first realism answer this question of interpretation? Namely, what would the world be like if the theory, the theory were true, but if the theory accurately presented the world? Once we've got our theory and we want to be mass first realists, how do we answer the question of interpretation? That's sort of the guiding concern for the rest of this talk. So let's look at how representation is supposed to work on the semantic view. And to remind you, my claim here is that representation on the semantic view is not mass first at all. Um, in, in, I should in the way I've made the difference between the language. So, um, scholars who use closer to the traditional distinction between whether a theory is represented as a class of models or a class of sentences. Of course, in that distinction, the semantic view is math first. Um, but then math first kind of becomes a, a much weaker claim. And we'll see that although on that definition, the semantic view is math first, it doesn't deliver on those advantages, right? So maybe. Um, slightly more precisely, I will claim that insofar as we have theories of representation on the semantic view, they don't give us those advantages that were listed on the previous slide, the supposed advantages of mathematics realism. So how is representation supposed to work on the semantic view? And I don't have any new insights here, so I just want you to take you through a few different options. And so one proposal is models represent the world in virtue of a similarity between them. The model might be in some way similar to the world. This is, of course, a very appealing thought. If we've got something like a physical model, right, a scale model is in some way similar to the system being modeled. And so maybe in virtue of that presents the system, one might think that something like this also holds for the mathematical models of contemporary physics are in some way similar to the systems being modeled. And the problem well known is that, you know, as they say, everything is similar to anything else in some respect. Um, there's this sort of abundance of properties. I can always find some property that's shared between the model and the system. Um, so that would mean anything represents anything else and the concept of representation becomes empty. And you know, one of the most well-known solutions to this, um, Gira, for example, is to make use of theoretical hypotheses. So I don't just have the model in the world and say they are similar. I have to specify exactly in which respect they are similar. What is the similarity between them? Crucially, these theoretical hypotheses are linguistic entities, right? They'd be specifications that say this bit of the model is similar to this bit. So, um, I, you know, if you look at Gira, this is explicitly mentioned. So I don't think this is in any way controversial. Um, but I think what we should recognize here is that a, a theoretical hypothesis is therefore similar to what Wallace calls a predicate precisification. It's a partial description of the theory in terms of objects, properties, and relations. It's exactly the kind of thing that the mass first approach um, was supposed to avoid. Okay, so let's try again. Maybe models represent the world in virtue of an isomorphism between them. Right? So now we've got a more formal relation, not something vague like similarity. It's something sort of well defined. I mean, we can ask you know, how can the mathematical structure be isomorphic to the world, right? This physical thing. Um, but more than that, the problem that we have is any model is isomorphic to some structure that we can find in the world, at least up to cardinality. This, of course, is paradox. Um, and what's the solution to Putnam's paradox? I mean, a can of worms I, I don't want to fully open, but one proposed solution is that we can specify in a language already understood an intended interpretation. This is von Frasen's solution to Putnam's paradox. Um, but again, the intended interpretation therefore is specified linguistically. We've got our models and maybe there is some particular element in the domain of the models and we'd like that element to be mapped onto a particular object in the physical world. And we just say in English, for example, this element in the model represents this object in the world. And um, French and Sartre, who are advocates of the semantic view, um, explicitly admit this. They say it is indeed the linguistic component of the semantic framework that allows us to sidestep 
the problem of an unintended mod. But since, of course, a lot is very controversial and very open to debate about um, Putnam's paradox. Um, and so you know, one option um, for Wallace here would just be to double down on the isomorphism view and say, I don't need anything linguistic. Um, but you know, I take it that at least many advocates of the semantic view actually still believe that to supplement the models with something linguistic to avoid its problems paradox. Okay, so what else is there? Right? We've seen similarity doesn't work. We've seen isomorphism doesn't work. There's this inferentialist account of representation, um, but at least in one version, Contessa's version, this requires uh, an analytic interpretation um, which identifies the objects, the properties, and the relations the theory talks about. So objects, properties, relations, recall those were exactly the things that the math first approach was meant to get us away from. So clearly, this is not the right approach consistent with math first realism. There is something called an inferentialist expressivist approach due to Khalif uh, and apologies to, to Shah because, you know, I've been told this is the incorrect inferentialist expressivist um, approach, and that's exactly because on this approach, uh, model elements are given interpretations using the resources of language. Okay, a very clear statement that's incompatible with the mass first view. Then there are representation as accounts, so Noyan and Frigg have developed a variety of those accounts. Um, this is again one of the more explicit uh, statements. Uh, representation as accounts require descriptions of physical systems that refer to physical objects and physical properties and relations. Okay, again, when we talk of objects, properties, and relations, the kind of distinctions that we find in language, but that we shouldn't be able to find in math first interpretations of theories. Okay. So I think what struck me in reading this literature is that essentially any account of scientific representation on the semantic view um, appeals to language either explicitly or implicitly. Okay. And so I think all of these approaches are anathema to the math first approach. Um, let me make that a little bit more explicit. Uh, so one thing, this is the second point that we've seen is um, interpretations of theories on those views are often going to involve heavy duty metaphysics, right? In setting up a correspondence between the theory's mathematical elements property, uh, to physical properties, relations, objects, and so on. Right? We're exactly going to be drawn into those questions like, what is the ontology of this theory? What's the ideology of this theory? Right? We've got these relations, but can we also have those relations without having any of the relata? Or do we need the relata? These are the things math first approach very explicitly wants to avoid. But we also get back this problem of uh, discontinuity and underdetermination, because once we need to establish some sort of correspondence in language between the things, the mathematical models and the things in the world, right, there's the possibility that the same or mathematically equivalent frameworks will lead to different linguistic interpretations. Once we need to specify what's the ontology and ideology of Maxwell theory versus newton cartan theory, very real possibility that prima facie we might get very different answers. And the only way to reconcile those answers, right, if someone claims, well, you've given two different interpretations of those theories, but actually they're the same, right, the way to do that would be to go back into heavy duty metaphysics and talk about things like dialectatism, for example. So um, Wallace says the move from a syntactic to a semantic and theories is itself more or less sufficient to turn standard realism into structural realism. And in particular, he means here um, his math first version of structural realism um, I, 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 is the less rather than the more. Right? I think um, as far as I can see, this is really just not true unless Wallace is working with um, you know, some sort of secret kind of scientific representation on the semantic view that um, I haven't been able to find. Um, good, so that was a minor claim, um, but I think this also shows that it's a good deal more difficult to get something um, like the maths first approach than it might have seemed. It's not just moving to the semantic view of theories and saying, let the math speak for itself, because we still need to answer this question. What does the theory say the world is like? And attempts to explain how we can answer this question on the semantic view, um, you know, inevitably appeal to language again. So let me now discuss some alternative approaches that might be more compatible with the maths first view. Um, and so this is kind of a long quote, but I won't read it all out. Um, essentially, what Wallace is trying to say here is um, 
He's defending the maximalist view against someone who says, well, we already understand how language represents the world. We've got very good theories of truth and reference. We don't at all understand how mathematics represent the world. We have very poor theories of scientific representation. Um, so Wallace makes a fair point here. He says, anything here is controversial. Truth and reference are too. Um, but in any case, right, we know that there are more ways to represent the world than language. As you mentioned, maps, arts, um, representational practices of non-linguistic animals. The point is we can represent the world without linguistics. Um, so it wouldn't go too far to say that the math first approach, mathematics is also a way to represent the world. And I think that's all fine. So I, I don't deny the sort of general possibility of the math first approach. Um, my question is not if, is it possible to represent the world without language? But rather how? Because we don't just want to represent the world without an appeal to language. We want to do it in a way that avoids discontinuities in interpretation, that avoids overly fine metaphysical distinctions, and that hopefully just gives us an idea of you know, what the theory says the world is like, that answers the question of interpretation. And so on the alternatives that I will survey, um, I think it looks like accounts of scientific representation that are compatible with the maximalist approach uh, make it very hard for us to say what the world is like. To a theory. So the first kind of approach um, is described by Neil Dewar. Uh, he calls it internalism. And the idea is representation is established not by setting up some sort of map between the theories and the world, but rather about but by making claims about the representational capacities of theories and the models that sort of stay within the theoretical framework. OK, so for example, we can claim that certain models within a theory or certain theories are equivalent. They've got the same representational capacities that are synonymous. Right? And Jura's idea is this already endows those theories with some partial meaning, partial interpretation, because knowing that those models or those theories are equivalent, even if I haven't told you anything else about what they actually represent, apart maybe some more domain, right? For mechanics, for example, um, already is going to constrain what they can eventually say about the world. The same goes for something like inter-theory relations, such as reduction and instantiation. If I tell you that one theory reduces to another theory, however exactly you want to cash that out, that's already partially specifying the meaning those theories, right? It's setting up a relation between them that maybe constrains the way they represent the world. And you might think likewise with claims about idealization and approximation. Okay. So I've mentioned uh, Neil Jura specifically. Um, Adam Colton's account of symmetries and interpretations also has a little bit of this flavor. So in that account, we've got the first stage of interpretation where we do set up an explicit correspondence between the theories and empirical things in the world. So we say, these are the things the theory says about what we can actually measure. But then in the second stage of interpretation, um, we maybe take a step back and we say, well, now let's try and maximize the symmetries between the models. Let's try to say that if two models are dynamically and empirically equivalent, they're synonymous. And then again, Jura is more explicit about this than Adam, um, right? This could already somehow endow the theory. So, um, you know, there are more details. Um, this paper is, is, is really interesting. Um, but I think what's relevant for me here is that on this view, there is still, it's very limited what we can say. If, you know, if we take a theory, and someone asks us, what does the theory say about what the world is like? The only thing really we can say here is that the world is such that it's accurately represented by such and so class of models in a certain limit, given certain idealizations. We can't, as it were, semantically descend um, to an object level talk about what the theory says about the world. Right? We can say those models are equivalent, those models aren't, and so that somehow already endows the theory or the models with meaning. But if we want to dig further, if we want to say, okay, but what do they actually say about the world, um, our resources become very limited. And so I think on Jira's account, this is a feature, not a bug. Right? Jira makes the comparison with language and he says, well, you know, what we're trying to describe the world in a natural language, for example, we've got the exact same problem. If I utter a sentence and you ask me, well, what does that sentence mean? The only thing I can do is utter or write down more sentences, right? So in the same way that we can't escape language and trying to explicate language, 
um, we can't explicate mathematical models in trying to make sense of mathematical models. Okay, so you know, fair enough, I think that's a good point. Um, and so I, I guess there are two sort of views one could have here. So one view would be to say that um, you know, language is sort of the water we swim in, so it's no problem that we can't further explicate language because we already speak language, but we know how it works. Um, right? The question never really arises. Again, I think this is quite similar to von Frazen's take on Putnam's paradox. Right, The reason Putnam's paradox doesn't arise for the language we speak ourselves is exactly because it's not um, the sort of object that we assign an interpretation to in speaking it. We already give it an interpretation. Um, and so one might think language is just different from mathematics here. And so for a language, we don't really need to ask this question, what does it all mean? Um, whereas for mathematics, we do. Or you might think, you know, we're in similar positions, and so we can't escape language, we can't escape mathematics. Um, in neither case is it a problem. This, of course, is a view that's more amenable to the maths first approach, but I think even then it's worth highlighting that if this is the way we adopt the maths first approach, it's, um, we, we do get the sort of strong conclusion that if someone asks you, what does the theory say the world is like? It's just a non-starter to try and utter some sentences in a full more natural language to answer that question. But the only thing we can do then is to, you know, utter bits of mathematics to put it starkly, to sort of stay within the mathematical framework of the theory. Apart from that, so I think that's not really an objection, that's just a consequence of internalism. I also have a few objections. One of them is a lot of this is going to depend you know, to make math first realism work. With internalism, it's going to depend on one's prior standards of theoretical equivalence. So in internalism, we have an approach to interpretation that doesn't require any linguistic elements. It's math first. But does it also solve the problem of underdetermination? Well, only if the stipulated equivalences are indeed always between theories um, that are empirically equivalent. It's, but nothing in internalism is inconsistent with the idea that, for example, Newton Cartan theory and Maxwell gravitation uh, are not stipulated to be synonymous. That internally within relations between those theories, we actually want to stipulate a non equivalence for one reason or another. Because, as I've said, even at the mathematical level, we can very well define certain relevant differences between those theories, the difference between curved and flat space time, for example. So, in order to make internalism work for the goals of math first realism, um, right, we need some strong input on uh, in which cases theories should actually be stipulated as being synonymous. And this leads to the second issue, which is that in doing so, metaphysical considerations still often play a central role. If one goes and reads Neil Jura's paper, and so this is more concerned with relations between models of one theory, so for example, shift related models of Newtonian mechanics, uh, which Jura says should be equivalent. But the reasoning for these conclusions, right, appeal to things like anti-exeitism, individuation of space-time points. Again, um, surprisingly, metaphysical conversations that what was on a mass-first approach would rather avoid. Right. So again, there's nothing that guarantees that internalism um, delivers on the aims of uh, Wallace's mass-first realism. So those are some reasons to be skeptical. There is a different approach, uh, which I call the pragmatist view. Uh, and one might sort of think of this as a, a better version of the inferentialist expressivist view I mentioned earlier. That could be one way of filling in the details of this view. Um, and so this would say something like the meaning of, of our theories of the mathematical models is established in virtue of the practice of physicists. OK, meaning for use would be the slogan. Um, and so there's kind of a fine balancing act because there are many accounts of representation that do emphasize the fact that models are used. So Gira emphasizes this, Van Brazen emphasizes it, um, but not in a way that's truly mathematics, right? So we've seen that mentioned Van Brazen and Gira, I don't think um, their views are in any way mathematics. They're quite explicit about needing linguistic means to establish representation, right? So it's not enough to just say, oh, you know, um, representation, an important element of representation is used, representation is pragmatic, representation is a three-place relation. That doesn't get you the kind of pragmatism I'm hinting at. On the other hand, some accounts of pragmatism in the literature seem to skew representation altogether. Right? So views that sort of say um, models are sort of artifacts um, that we use, 
uh, without any representational content. Um, and again, I don't, I, I take it that Matamers doesn't want to go that far. Right? So um, I'm not actually aware of any work type account of scientific representation um, that sort of finds this balance, although I've been told that to share might have the key. Um, but, um, you know, so definitely think that something like this could be possible. Um, but as far as I'm aware, um, there's nothing there yet. Um, but again, if we want to know, you know, how does a pragmatist view answer the question of interpretation? If I've got my theory and I want to know what is the world like, the answer would be something like, well, let's look at how it's used. Right? The world is such that one can successfully apply the theory to it in such and so way. Right? We wouldn't then get a sort of description in some way of what the theory actually says about the world. Um, and so again, one might sort of think that this limits our ability to answer this question of interpretation. So again, I have some objections to pragmatism or any um, sort of future version of pragmatism as well. One of them is it may not be possible to clearly separate the linguistic and mathematical practices of working physicists, right? I mean, of course, physics uses mathematics, they define mathematical models. Uh, but, you know, if you open a physics textbook, it doesn't just contain a list of mathematics, right? There will be various asides, remarks, philosophical reflections. I mean, it depends on the physicists, but, um, you know, they can get quite philosophical. And so if you wanted to have something like pragmatism and say the meaning of those models is defined by their use, but one also wants to say, but in such a way to avoid uh, metaphysical talk, right? you might have to be quite revisionist about what we include and what we exclude about the practice of scientists. Right? We might open some um, science textbooks or you know, utterances of um, physicists in the uh, faculty canteen and say, well, we're not going to include those in the sort of base of use acts that form part of their meaning, because if we would do that, um, we'd still be implicitly committed to certain metaphysical views. So that's one obstacle. And the other obstacle, again, is it's just unclear prima facie why use equivalence should always track mathematical equivalence, right? So why should the theories that are used in the same way and therefore presumably would have the same meaning, why would those be exactly the theories that are mathematically equivalent? Um, where mathematical equivalence here is the kind of mathematical equivalence we need to avoid under determination. So uh, it doesn't seem at all implausible to me that there are theories that one would consider um, potentially underdetermined, right? The difference between um, newton cartan theory and Maxwell gravitation, or maybe something like ADS and CFT, uh, which are actually used very differently. I mean, they might have wholly different research programs. They might be different communities. Again, in the sort of broader linguistic acts of physicists or their informal discussions, they might um, say that those theories are very different. So if we want mass first realism to solve this problem of underdetermination, um, that's only going to be the case contingently on certain facts about the way those theories are used in practice. So again, those, you know, those are obstacles, they're not sort of no-go theorems, uh, but there are some reasons to be skeptical about whether um, even if we've got a version of math as realism, it can really give us what we want. So this is not meant to be exhaustive. There might be third and fourth and fifth approaches to scientific representation that are truly math first that I haven't thought of. Uh, but you know, those seem to me two very plausible options um, and options that one, make it difficult to answer this question of interpretation, and two, um, might not deliver on the promises of math first realism once they're free. Okay, so like I've said, I believe the answer is no uh, to this question. Those alternative approaches uh, don't really answer or don't really help us answer the question of interpretation. On the internalist approach, we can only formulate some constraints on representation. If someone, you know, really presses you and says, okay, but what does the theory say about what the world is like? Right? There's just nothing more we can say than, well, I've stipulated these synonymies. Um, and so, you know, the theory accurately represents the world given those constraints. Uh, and likewise, with pragmatism, right, we can only really describe the behavior of theory users. Right? Anything that goes beyond that, anything that would um, try and go further might introduce overly fine metaphysical distinctions, discontinuities, etc. And so I don't think in the end this should be very surprising. I think 
if one thinks about what the mathematics approach, or at least my version of it, is supposed to be, um, then of course this traditional view of interpretation, where we take the products of physics and we then go and say what it means, is going to be radically changed. Um, it feels to me that, at least in the discussions I've had and when I read this paper, um, this maybe hasn't always been appreciated. And in particular, it seems that if this is the approach we want to adopt, then philosophy of physics or philosophers of physics um, might have to change the way they approach theories. And I only want to speak for myself, so certainly the way I approach philosophy of physics, um, in case it seems opposed to um, the mass first approach. So in more detail, I think on the internalist approach, philosophy of physics becomes a little bit more like theoretical physics itself. So what we're really interested in on this approach in making sense of physics is try and establish more or less formal results between theories, results about reduction and instantiation, uh, results about different types of equivalents. Um, you know, there is room for kind of more abstract reasonings because in deciding which theories or models we stipulate to be equivalent, uh, you know, that's not a purely formal question. But then we're also not allowed on the math first approach to all out and, you know, approach this question by discussing things like anti exotism or individuation. Um, right, it's, it's still going to be more limited, I think. Um, and on the pragmatist approach, you might think that philosophy of physics uh, is going to become a, you know, branch of linguistics. Basically, the best thing we could do as philosophers of physics to really understand theories, uh, to answer the question of interpretation, if the meaning of theories is really determined by their use, is to go undercover in a physics department as it were, become native speakers. <laughs> and again, there might be nothing wrong with this, um, but speaking again for myself, it would be a very different approach from the approach I currently take, uh, which of course is to try and learn from physicists and to understand physics, but also to add something to it. And so, um, yeah, I, I think those um, consequences of the mass first approach are interesting to think about. Um, and, you know, for what it's worth, I think, uh, you know, as far as I can see, David Wallace is very good at leading by example. I think his work is very tuned to what's actually going on in the practice of physicists. Um, you know, there is a, there, there are a lot of very strong and interesting formal results. Um, I mean, that's, you know, nothing to say to criticize David Wallace because his work is also very philosophically rich and interesting. So if there is one way that Max Meyer's um, philosophy of physics, you know, could be really rich and interesting, then it would definitely be the way that Wallace approaches it. Um, but I, I still think, you know, many of the discussions we have in philosophy of physics, the ontology of theories, um, relations with that, relata, all that, um, right, would essentially have to disappear. So that's quite a radical consequence. So, uh, yeah, one final uh, thing to add here, right, this doesn't, of course, mean that um, linguistic descriptions can't in some other way help us gain understanding. So, for example, um, you know, one slightly dismissive view one might have of philosophy of physics on the mass first realist view would be uh, it's essentially akin to popular science. So we're not giving the full truth of the theory, uh, but we're sort of trying to describe it in different ways that help people achieve some sort of albeit imprecise understanding. Um, and this might not be a bad thing either, uh, but again, it would be very different from the origin myth that I started with. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, maybe feeling it slightly strong, but it seems to me that there's currently no accepted alternative to the traditional picture of interpretation on which we use linguistic resources to answer what the world would be like if the theory were true. And this is going to be the case either on the semantic or on the syntactic. You know, so just adopting the semantic view wouldn't get us out of this traditional picture of interpretation. Even if one were to become available, right, one of the approaches I've discussed is something else. It's far from clear that it would lead to a form of structural realism. So a form of math first realism that overcomes discontinuities in interpretation and overcomes metaphysics. Um, and finally, if this were to succeed, uh, then we should also radically reconceive the aims of interpretation. What is it that philosophers of physics are doing? And you know, the origin myth was a myth, um, but might be a motivating myth, and so I think that would have to be abandoned. Good. So thank you very much for listening. I'm very curious to hear what I've been.